So, let's talk about Todd McFarlane. Yes, Todd McFarlane, artist and publisher, animator, collector of baseballs, and of course manufacturer of highly collectible action figures that mysteriously break in the packaging. Todd McFarlane is all of those things, and yet so much more. After short stints on a DC book called Infinity Inc. and Marvel's The Incredible Hulk, McFarlane would rise to prominence as the artist on Amazing Spider-Man, starting in 1988. However, by 1990, McFarlane was starting to feel creatively stifled, as he wanted to both write and draw Spider-Man. With that, McFarlane issued an ultimatum to Marvel Editor-in-Chief Tom DeFalco. Give him a chance to write and draw Spider-Man, or he walks. McFarlane thought this would result in him getting a co-writer for an initial story to ease him in, which Marvel had done previously with the likes of other artists turned writers like John Byrne, Frank Miller, and Walt Simonson. Instead, Marvel decided to just throw McFarlane to the wolves and give him his own Spider-Man book straight away. The book, called Spider-Man, or Objectively Spider-Man to differentiate it from the three other Spider-Man ongoings at the time, Amazing, Spectacular, and Web of, would be a commercial success with its first issue selling 2.75 million copies. Today, we're looking at the first five-issue story arc of this new Spider-Man series. This is Spider-Man Torment. Spider-Man breaks up a mugging. When the hood attempts to shoot the wall crawler, the gun gets bent in half. Afterwards, Spider-Man returns home to Mary Jane. It's amazing. He's taken on Dr. Octopus, the Rhino, the Green Goblin, even Thanos on a couple of occasions. And yet, every time he just meets a thug with a gun, they just think that they're going to be the one to take down Spider-Man. Elsewhere, a group of thugs loots an electronics store, only to be jumped by longtime Spider-Man adversary, the Lizard. He literally rips through all of them, and as this plays out, a woman adds a spider and a lizard to a cauldron filled with blood. She then begins playing a ritualistic drum beat. The next day, Peter Parker doesn't notice the headlines or a photograph of an apparent clue scribbled on the wall as he heads out to work on his graduate thesis. As the day goes by, the Lizard claims another victim. In case you were wondering, no, I have no idea why there are sensor bars on the Lizard here. My only guess is that maybe McFarlane got a little gory with his artwork and there were pieces of viscera dangling from the lizard's outfit. Two middle-aged men exit a bar, joking about a personal ad in the newspaper looking for sugar daddies. Unfortunately, they wander into the wrong alley where they soon become victims of the lizard. The next day, Peter actually notices the headlines and realizes who's behind everything. The lizard has been trying to spell out the name Connors on the wall while committing his crimes. He immediately dons his Spider-Man suit and leaves without saying goodbye to Mary Jane. I know I've covered this before, but just for a quick refresh, Dr. Kirk Connors was an acclaimed geneticist who injected himself with a serum derived from lizard DNA in an attempt to regrow a severed arm. However, the serum didn't stop there and instead transformed Connors into a humanoid lizard creature bent on creating others like him. Spider-Man was eventually able to reverse the effects of the serum, though that has only proven to be temporary. Spidey's attempt to locate the lizard is halted as his spider sense suddenly begins going berserk. This is accompanied by a rhythmic drumbeat pounding in his head. Spider-Man crashes through the window of a skyscraper, and before he can reorient himself, the lizard comes flying through after him. The lizard rips through the chest of Peter's outfit and begins to overwhelm him. Spider-Man wriggles away enough to get to an elevator, but the reprieve is minute at best as the lizard soon comes crashing through the door. Spidey manages to land a kick to knock the lizard down. Unfortunately, the lizard winds up getting impaled on the broken shard of an elevator door. Thinking he's killed Dr. Connors, Spider-Man slinks away to recover. However, when he turns around, the lizard has just disappeared. The drum beats have stopped for now, but Peter can't help but feel he's somehow been poisoned. Soon, the lizard is back for more. Also, Mary Jane has gone out clubbing where some scuzzy guy has tried to hit on her. Just thought you'd like to know. Spider-Man and the Lizard topple through the chimney of a brownstone, and Spider-Man is forced to hurl bricks in an attempt to slow the monster down. None of this pleases the woman back in the mansion. The spider is meant to suffer. The Lizard continues his relentless pursuit as Spider-Man desperately tries to reach Dr. Connors. It's futile as the drum pounding increases, causing Spider-Man to pass out. The Lizard then picks up Spider-Man and hurls him over the edge of the brownstone and into a dumpster. As Peter lays unconscious in a pile of garbage, he dreams of the moments that made him who he is. The spider bite, the death of Uncle Ben, and his love for Mary Jane. That causes Peter to come back for life and begin fighting his way to the surface. This is all starting to feel vaguely familiar. Spider-Man manages to fight his way out of the dumpster, where he's immediately greeted by the vision of Craven the Hunter's resurrected corpse. See what I mean? Chalking it up to the poison he feels inside him, Peter is aware that this is an hallucination. He tries to fight back, but is still too weak from the fall and collapses. This does, however, allow him to break the illusion, and Craven soon becomes a woman in similar garb. She tells the lizard to pick up Spider-Man and take him back to the mansion. Okay, this woman is named Calypso, and she's one of Sergei Kravinov's many former lovers. While she used her 
voodoo magic in order to alter Craven's mind, sending him into a unique blood range, meaning that she's actually partially responsible for his actions during the Craven's Last Hunt storyline. Also, somewhere along the way, she managed to induce the lizard transformation in Dr. Kirk Connors. Spider-Man awakens in Craven's old mansion with the lizard chomping at the bit to decapitate the wall crawler. Peter once more tries to reach Dr. Connors to no avail as Calypso is in total control. She then begins performing a ritual that causes the drum beats to resume. However, just as quickly, the drums stop. Spider-Man snaps free from his bonds and begins fighting with the lizard. The two knock over several lit candles, one of which lands near a ruptured gas line. Soon, there's an explosion. Yeah, you think Calypso would have maybe, like, did some scouting and did an initial scan of the mansion before using it as a staging ground for something like this. Peter does his best to avoid the burning debris while also gathering his thoughts. The explosion is enough that even MJ can see it from her cab ride home, which begins to arouse her worst fears. Somehow, neither Calypso or the Lizard appear to be harmed as the two emerge and begin coming back at Spider-Man. The drum beats return, however, this time Spidey appears unaffected as he leaps down on top of the Lizard. Still, the monster is simply too strong to go down so easily. Sensing that her magical poison may be wearing off, Calypso calls for the Lizard to deliver a killing blow. Spidey manages to slip away once more and uses a group of chains to entangle the Lizard and hang him from a rafter. This allows Spider-Man to turn his attention to Calypso. However, the sirens from approaching emergency vehicles distract Spider-Man long enough for Calypso to just vanish into thin air. Spider-Man leaves to leave as the first responders begin surveying the site and notice the now empty chains that once held the lizard. A beaten and bloodied Spider-Man makes his way home where Mary Jane is waiting. And that concludes our look at this storyline, which means I probably should have made this reference at some point. Torment! And so how was Spider-Man Torment? Well... I'd always heard that the story was very aptly named and that it was just terrible. I mean, yeah, it sold well, but it wasn't very good. And, well, I do think there are some positives to this. I do like McFarlane's artwork throughout all this. I think it sets up some decent atmosphere in some places. And uh, some of the characterization is pretty good. I like Peter Parker in this. I love the little bit at the beginning where he's talking about the various villains he's faced. And, you know, whenever he faces just a common street thug, they always think that they're going to be the ones to take down Spider-Man. Like I said, it was just a little kind of funny point, and I do like the way he uses the lizard in this. I think the lizard really comes across like a monster and a genuine threat to Spider-Man, and that's something that's not always well handled. They usually try to go for the tragic backstory and the man inside the monster storyline with this, and this it's just monster, and I think it's a very unique turn. And that's kind of where the compliments end, unfortunately. Um, this is a really poorly paced story. It's just way too padded out with narratorial captions spread out over four or five panels when it could easily just be summed up in one or two. I mean, I'm all for describing the atmosphere of New York City, but you don't need to take two pages to do it. I mean, like I said, a panel is more than enough, really. You could set enough with that. Like, this is a two-issue story that got stretched out to five, and... You know what, um, the characterization, like I said, with Peter and the Lizard, pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, with Mary Jane, uh, not so much. I mean, her big story arc is she can't wait till Peter comes home so that they can have sex. Yeah, not the most rewarding storyline there. Just, again, it's pretty weak. And uh, probably the biggest sin of all in this like I said before, this just comes across like poor man's Craven's Last Hunt. I mean, I think it's great that McFarlane used that as a story as a basis. It's a good story, obviously. It's an amazing story. And you should probably take inspiration for something like that. But he didn't really build on it. He just made a pale imitation. Calypso just does not come across as threatening in any way outside of the drumbeat thing. And even that just gets repetitive after a while. So... Like I said, it just really falls flat. I'm going to give Spider-Man Torment a D. Like I said, it's not the worst thing ever. I've certainly read way worse things on this show, but it's not very good. And with that, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review.
can help support my channel at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cat productions. There, you can request a trade to be put in the randomizer, aka the cardboard box. Also, remember, like, comment, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell.